Well, I want to thank you all for being here, and uh, today I want to talk to you about my body. I figured that was probably one of the more compelling ways I could open this talk. The Probably the slightly more compelling way would be to say, I want to talk to you about your body, but that would definitely... See, nobody laughed at that. That's, that's creepy. That is just creepy when I talk about that. So how about I be very inclusive and say I want to talk about our bodies? And I specifically want to talk about the research and the things that I've been learning lately and what I've been looking at. Um... I am an ordained minister, I am a professional speaker, but I consider myself a behavioral scientist, honestly. I read every book I can to try and figure myself, to figure life out, and to live it at the highest possible level. I just got business cards, and I should have put that my, you know, initials, like some people get, you know, MBA or whatever, I should have gotten FSO, figures stuff out, because that's, that's really what I see my, my role as. And then I get to turn around and teach it. So I use myself as this guinea pig, and then hopefully I get these other guinea pigs and improve their lives. So whether you're a guinea pig online or a guinea pig here, I want to say thank you. And you're probably wondering if you're watching online why I'm sitting like this and dressed like this. We just finished doing 45 minutes of yoga here at what we call Sangha Yoga Church in Kansas City, Missouri. And now this is my opportunity to do what is called a Dharma talk. The word Dharma simply means purpose. I believe that our purpose is love. That's that's it. Our purpose is love. And I believe that we get in our own way time and time and time again. And I also believe that things that have happened to us in our own lives get, into, get in our way. Things that we're not even aware of. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. When I was a little boy, many of you know I had a father who was basically sort of ignored me unless he was spanking me or criticizing me. I, that would be the short, the short way of putting it. Um, the thing was, and of course I saw no relation at that time, I developed a bunch of nervous habits. I used to do this thing a lot. I would roll my top lip and my bottom lip all the time. And so to help me stop doing that, my father would hit me whenever he saw me doing that. Not hard, but he would just come over and thump me on the head. That was his big thing, thumping us on the head, which, of course, made me want to do this. Now, I realize I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking about minimally one in three people, as I shared last week, have endured some sort of traumatic neglect and abuse or, and or abuse as children. And that impacts our lives. It impacts the way we look at other people. It impacts everything. So I want to talk to you about this book today. And I shared it with you before. It's called The Body Keeps the Score by, I have to look at his name, Bessel van der Kolk, MD. It was recommended to me by a friend and I started reading this book. And basically what it's about, to put it in a nutshell, he is a psychiatrist who has worked with a number of people with mental health issues. He started out actually working in mental health hospitals, people who were incurable, who were put in there. What he discovered as was that when he could actually talk to these incurable people, he found that to a person they had all had severely abused and neglectful childhoods. They were basically abused into the home. Does that make sense? Okay. He then began to work with a lot of the pharmaceutical companies, and they began to test all of the new medicines, Wellbutrin, Paxil, all the things that people have been on over the years. He has been involved in the testing of it to see what was effective and what was not effective. Now, I started off telling you about my nervous habits as a little boy. About the time I stopped rolling my face, I started biting my nails. I can remember, it used to, I was one of those with the bloody nails, you know what I'm talking about? And of course, my father used to tell me I very lovingly to stop doing that. And so then what I noticed was I developed what's called hyperhidrosis. Does anyone know what that is? Break it down. Well, that actually, that's, I wish it was drinking a lot. It's sweating a lot. Excessive sweating. I would put on a shirt and it would be just absolutely soaked. Now, many of you know that my older brother made his transition in December of this year. By older, I mean he was 59, y'all. 
That's young by anybody's standards these days. My older brother, people used to always say, seemed like an old man even as a child. As he got older, his hands shook all the time. Well, to tie all this together, about a month ago, I was doing a speech And I always wear a mic like I'm wearing. This is called a country man, but I wear some version of this when I'm speaking. Well, I got on stage, 500 people, and I'm speaking, and the mic, out. (laughs) That was no good. So I asked them to hand me a handheld microphone, and I'm standing there speaking, holding the handheld microphone, and I noticed my hand was shaking. Now, I don't get nervous when I speak. I get excited, but I don't get nervous, so I don't shake. And then I began to look at this, and I thought about my brother and his hand shaking. And I thought about my doctor and how much she dislikes me. (laughs) Because every time I go in to see her, I've got some sort of an excuse. Not a problem, but an excuse. Because what's the one of the first what are the first things you do when they go to the doctor? Number one is they they take your vital signs, which means they weigh you, right? And then they always right? Okay. My whenever I get my blood pressure done, it's like a Popeye cartoon. Okay? It should go and then go with a big steam whistle out of it, okay? I mean, an average blood pressure for me, I can't believe I'm saying this on camera, is like 180 over 130. But I would always say to the doctor, you know, I just ran up the stairs. <laughs> oh, um, I've got shoulder pain. That's, that's why it is. I'm in pain. Uh, I just had coffee. <laughs> my best friend in high school, my very best friend, still in our close contact today, had two strokes at the age of 49 from high blood pressure. I think maybe I might want to start looking at this. Hence this book that I want to tell you about, The Body Keeps the Score. What this man discovered was, after working with all of the various pills and everything that we give ourselves to try and mitigate the pain and suffering that is going on inside of us, and in addition to all of the talk therapy, which is so vital and which he leads and recommends, his belief is, and it's been scientifically proven, we are energetic beings. As soon as you die, your body begins to decompose. There is some sort of energy that is in there that is vibrating. And when it's gone, you're gone. But as long as it's here, it's like a tuning fork. You are a tuning fork. That's why it's said that you are the aggregate of the five people you hang around with most. You pick up their energy. You pick up other people's energy. And not only that, when you're going through traumatic experiences, especially during the developmental process of your brain, the brain can actually not develop fully in those areas. Raise your hand. Does that make sense? Have I lost y'all yet? Let me go even further. The brain begin. The brain develops. I know we have some nurses here. Does it develop from the front to back or the back to front? When you're back to front. That's right. That's this is your animal brain. This is your sustenance brain. This is the lizard brain. It's called. This is the brain that says, "I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm cold. Feed me." Some people never get out of that. <laughs> But we want to laugh at them and say, oh, there's something wrong with them. The thing is, from here to here, and I'm such a great example, you can see everything. (laughs) From this bump back here, going forward, up until you're about 28, your brain develops. And if you suffer traumas during that time, it literally messes your brain up so where that development doesn't take place. Not only that, neurons that fire together wire together. Now here's what that means. Danny Thomas was a comedian who had a television show. For those of us who are old enough to remember, that's okay. For those of us who are old enough to remember, he had a television show, but he also did stand-up. That's how he started. And Danny Thomas used to say that the greatest respect he could give his father was that even as a as a as a grown man, when his father walked in the room, he would duck. 
that was meant as a joke, y'all. He would duck. The thing is, I don't think it was a joke for many people. The thing is, if you equate father with duck, with I'm going to get hit, that gets wired together. Does that make sense? Fired enough? Now, if you wire dad with big hug and I love you, then when someone who is a father figure acts unloving towards you, your brain doesn't know how to handle that. But if you're used to being treated unlovingly, when someone treats you lovingly, your brain literally, that's the old joke about his brain exploded. Mm -hmm. What the heck's wrong with you? Don't you know I'm unlovable? I've been tre treated that way my whole life. And as a result of the traumas that go on in your life because we are energetic beings, our bodies pick it up. This is the, core, the cause of fibromyalgia. This is the cause of, they believe, of um, uh, ADHD. It's the cause of so many things. Is really family of origin issues that have not healed. <sighs> but there's hope. There's hope. One of the things that this book recommends, each book, it's a long book in each chapter, there's several chapters, about 12 chapters on things you can do to basically reintegrate your mind and your body and to heal yourself. And one of the first things that he recommends is what we just did. What did we just do? Yoga. Yoga. Yoga, Yoga makes you very aware of your body, does it not? Why is my knee shaking when I'm doing this pose? Have you noticed that? Why is my knee shaking? I could stand on one foot yesterday. Why can't I today? It makes you very aware of your body. But we miss one very important thing about yoga, and it comes down to the end. The corpse pose. What's the last pose? What do we do? What's it called? Shavasana. How many of you have done yoga in places other here, other than here at In Bliss? Raise your hand. Good. Our Shavasana tends to be longer and more sacred. Would you not agree? It's absolutely. That's the difference. Because you're supposed to be absolutely still. I know I'm jumping all around, but y'all are good enough to stay with me. Here's what I noticed about my brother. His energy was never still. My energy is rarely still. People who have worked with me admire what I'm able to accomplish, but the word they most often use is not focused, it's intense. I want to be focused because intense is like this. Now, why am I? Did I decide to be intense growing up? You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Intense. <laughs> That's what I want to be. I want to be intense. No, as a child, I braced my body all the time to protect myself. I never knew if my father was going to miss hitting my brother and hit me instead. So I braced all the time. So I, as I grew, as my brain was forming, my brain told me that my body needs to be a little more. Everybody right now, tighten your body. Okay? Now imagine walking around that way all the time. Would you be more or less likely to strain a muscle doing something? More! <laughs> Hence, I tend to get a lot of strained muscles. So I'm reading this book, and I notice that Shavasana, that integration pose, is more than that. It is an opportunity for us to still our bodies 100%. And that's what Marty, Starr, Amy, all of them teach us. Be 100% still. Is that easy, yes or no? No, I always say Shavasana is the hardest pose, right? Do not move at all. But it's because in our culture, we're just raised, move, 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 go, 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 go. You are literally set at a higher level than people who used to live, and they had a one in three chance of being killed by someone else, whereas you have a one in 10,000 chance. But we're more stressed, we're more amped, we're more up. I got up one morning and I did my morning ritual. That includes having breakfast with Marty 
uh, she always reads To You Love God, which I wrote to me, which I think is sweet. And then we, we chant, I walk my dog and I do my mindfulness meditation. Then I sit and do five minutes of visualization. Then I do 15 minutes of meditation. That's every morning. That's what I do. I did all of that and then I went to see Teresa Hubbard, who is a local uh, psychiatrist and psychologist who, who works with doing what's called neurofeedback, which is highly recommended in this book. And so I went to do this. Now, does it sound like I was pretty well blissed out when I walked in there? Say yes, hopefully, should be. She hooked an EEG machine up to me, an electroencephalogram, to measure my brain waves, my high beta waves, which is when you're flex like this, Okay, when you're afraid something's going to hit you or something, you're tense, your high betas go high. Mine were three times higher than the average. And yet, was I doing everything I could to meditate, to this, to that? Say, yeah. Yes. Trying to relax. The thing was, and this is what I want to talk to you about, you don't know what your set score is. You think you do because it's just you. But there is a calmer version of you, that Brahmastan we talked about earlier, that calm center of you that wants to be there. And in this day and age, there's no reason not to be there, except for the news wants to keep you upset, and your friends want to keep you upset, because if you're upset, you are controllable. So I went in and I started and I had this electroencephalogram and I discovered that I'm a tense guy. <laughs> <laughs> to which I said, no, I'm not. I'm just <laughs> so then we began the neurofeedback. It's seven weeks and I play a video game with my mind. It's really cool. They hook an EE, she hooks an EEG up to me, and then I get to pick what kind of a bird I am. I picked an eagle. And then the eagle flies through the sky, and it looks very real. And there's all these distractions, like balloons in the air and things moving on the side. But you are to steer the eagle through these giant green circles that are way up ahead of you. You have no joystick. Your EEG knows whether or not you are focused on the middle of the circle. <laughs> Is that cool? Would that increase your focus, yes or no? Okay, yeah. that's half of it. Marty's also doing it. She's doing it to develop more of the focus. I'm doing it to develop more of the relaxation. Because as soon as you start to get tense, the eagle drifts away from the circle. So you've got to not only be 100% focused on where you're going, you got to be totally chill about getting there. <laughs> and it gets increasingly difficult week after week. Because what I've noticed is now the circles aren't all straight on. Some of them are a little sideways. They're 3D circles. And as you're flying towards it, at the last minute, no matter how calm you are, a little bit of breeze blows the eagle and you're like, oh, the eagle's not going to make it. And as soon as you do that, oh, what do you think happens? He goes, damn right, and <laughs> keeps going. But if you can go, it's going to happen and just be totally calm, the eagle goes through. And if you score enough points, you get to be an alien surfer, which I was last week. <laughs> I'm bringing all this up to you to let you know what I've discovered doing this. That for me, and I think for many of us, we associate accomplishment with anxiety. Being anxious about it. Performing, doing it, instead of being calm in our bodies, being as calm as possible. So the, the, the question that I discovered and that I want to invite you all to begin to, I lost my clicker here, behind me on this side. Thank you very much. Here's what I discovered. I've been asking myself this one question, and that's not it. But that's okay. I'll tell you what the question is. 
How many of you have heard of affirmations? Raise your hand. Affirmations are positive statements about yourself, right? Positive, personal, powerful, whatever it is. There's four things. I once heard Tony Robbins say, and I tend to agree with him, that affirmations don't work. And here's why. You don't believe them. You know, if you're very obese like I was and to say, I am thin, I am thin, I am thin, your mind goes, no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. But ultimately it will go, okay, well then how are you going to be thin? And that's how we control the mind is with questions. How are you going to be thin? We control our mind and other people's minds with questions. And so the question I began to ask myself was, how relaxed is my body? How relaxed is my body? Not just when I'm sitting here with you all. But when my accountant called the other day, you're laughing because don't you kind of go when your accountant calls? For me, it's my accountant and my agent. How relaxed is my body? Now, this is what I've discovered. How many of you see chiropractors? Raise your hand. Have you ever gone in with a vertebrae that has gotten out? And as a result, the muscle is super tense. Raise your hand. But then the doctor puts the vertebrae in, but because the muscle is tense, it pulls it out over the next few days. Raise your hands. That happen? Happens all the time. Here's the thing. If your body is tense, your mind will be tense. After all these years of meditating, <laughs> which I think was great, I can focus my mind very well, and yet my body will pull it right out because my body feels like it's supposed to be more. So I'm asking you, how are you in the world? How relaxed is your body? Because if you can relax your body, if you can be in that shavasana, that corpse pose, which, by the way, it doesn't mean corpse pose. It means corpse but asana does not mean pose. We've come to believe that asana means pose. Asana means pose, rather. Asana means to settle comfortably into. Think of that next time you're struggling in yoga. Not only am I supposed to do this, I'm supposed to settle comfortably into this pose. <laughs> or I'm not doing this pose. The corpse pose means to settle comfortably into death. To have your body as still and as chill as if you were dead. And can you stand it? And if not, how relaxed is my body? Don't say, my body is relaxed, my body is relaxed, because your mind's going to go, no, it's not, no, it's not. Say, the question is what? Say it. How relaxed is, how relaxed is my body? By observing, we change, we've discovered. Simply observing something changes it. By looking at your body and saying, while you're doing yoga, how relaxed is my body? Can you do yoga and still be fully engaged with your muscles tense, but not your body tense? Does that make sense? It's the difference between this and this. You see? Huge difference. The world today is doing everything it can to keep you anxious. Do you know what the word anxious means? Uncertain, excuse me, worry over an uncertain future. You know what the future's going to be like? Just like this. Exactly. <laughs> Just like this. Unless you change or do something different. And you've made it so far, right? So you might as well, how relaxed is my body? And when the body becomes more relaxed, the mind becomes more relaxed. And as the mind becomes more relaxed, the body becomes more relaxed. And it becomes this beautiful symbiosis where you can be fully relaxed and fully engaged at the same time. Would you like that? Raise your hand. All right. Begin to ask yourself right now and going forward as often as you can. Put it on your mirror. Set it on your phone. Mine goes off on my phone at 10, 2, and 4 to ask me, guess what? What does it ask me? 
How relaxed is your body? <coughs> Ask yourself. Begin to become aware of it. And as you do, you'll chill, you'll feel less stressed, and you'll accomplish more. Take somebody's hand. Let's close in prayer. Infinite Spirit, we acknowledge the truth that we were not born to move between fight and flight all the time. That we were meant to be here, now, present, happy, calm. And as we calm our bodies, we calm our minds. And as we calm our minds, we calm our bodies. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to use our mind, to be aware of our body, and to change our lives. And so it is. Amen. No more, no more complaining people. Their lives are changing. We're flying high, creating a complaint-free world. No more, no more complaining people. Their lives are changing. We're flying high, creating a complaint-free world. No more, no more. There's no more complaining.